All right, let's get started. Hi, my name's Dave, and I'm a developer advocate with Google Cloud Platform. My area of focus is DevOps and the DevOps community. So I spend my time listening to practitioners, working to understand your challenges, your solutions, and your ambitions. And I share that knowledge throughout the community, and I bring it back to my colleagues at Google. You've probably heard the phrase, shift left. What does that mean? Well, we envision our software development life cycle moving from left to right. And shifting left means to incorporate critical processes earlier in the cycle. Why? Because software gets more complex as it moves from left to right, which means that the cost of addressing problems gets exponentially larger. Now, we can shift left on lots of things. We can shift left on the merge. That's the original meaning of continuous integration. We can shift left on security, and this is a hot topic these days. When we incorporate security early in our planning process, we get better results. And we can shift left on testing, which is our subject today. Folks here are probably familiar with the research done by NST and IBM and others that shows that if a bug is caught early in the cycle, it costs way less to fix than if it's caught later. That order of magnitude can be, uh, some studies say 6x, some studies say 30x, some studies say 100x, whatever it is, it's a lot of x's. And so it's really good to catch them early. Now, why is that? I think of two reasons. One, when you catch it early, it hasn't had a chance to uh, cause any downstream effects. So you're fixing one bug, not 100. And two, when you can catch a bug early, you're keeping it, catching it while it's still in the developer's mind, while they still have that context for it. When it's later, they've forgotten all about it, they've moved on, or someone else has to pick it up and figure it out, and that's really hard. So shifting left is good for development. And in fact, we have data to prove this. Uh, this is data from the DORA, or DevOps Research and Assessment Group, that shows that continuous integration predicts continuous delivery, which can predict better business outcomes, like uh, better software delivery performance and higher availability. Testing earlier and often is good for business. It makes developers happier, and it makes CEOs happier. So what do we test? Well, here's the test pyramid. At the bottom, there are lots of little unit tests that run fast and find issues cheaply. Then we have integration tests where we combine components and see how they behave together. And then at the top is end-to-end -to -end tests where we do a full user journey across multiple interactions. That's out of scope for today, but the techniques we're gonna look at will apply up to that level as well. Now, this is an idealized test pyramid. And here's what we usually see for real. We've got a handful of unit tests, zero integration tests, and up at the top, one really brittle end-to-end -end test that uh, is all broken all the time, so we actually just ignore it, right? And no judgment. This stuff is hard. And microservices make it harder. The whole point of microservice architecture is to isolate things, right? So that every team can work independently. And as we've done that, what I hear more and more from people is that every team is responsible for their service, but no one's really responsible for all of them together. Every team, wow, that was loud. How about if I mute those notifications? There we go. Do not disturb. Every team pushes their own service directly to prod, and we hope that it all works together when it gets there. But hope is not a strategy. However, integration testing is really hard. So why bother? Well, when everyone's independently pushing their code to prod, we're going to rely on contracts between the different teams to make sure that things work. Contracts like semantic versioning. Semantic versioning is great, but we need to be clear about what it is. It's a promise, and promises are meant to be broken. It's like uh, I talked to my nine-year-old son about things like this, and he thinks that like, if something is guaranteed, then it's going to happen. And I've had to break his little heart by explaining to him that it might not happen. It just means that there's repercussions if it doesn't. Uh, and in the software world, those repercussions are going to be errors. So let's understand that semantic versioning is a great promise, but we also need the reassurance that that promise is being kept. Another way to come about this whole thing is the idea of testing and prod. Who's heard that phrase, testing and prod? All right, good. They're doing their job. I see that the vendors are out there doing that one. 
Uh, this is a hot topic these days, and it's a movement that advocates that we should treat our production deployments as uncertain and do quality testing in prod. And then if there's a problem, if there's an error, we quickly roll back. So is that what we should do? Should we throw our stuff into prod and then figure out if it works? Yes. Because no matter how confident you are in your code, prod is always different from non-prod. Things will break. So yes, treat your production deployments as uncertain and test and iterate. We should plan for failures and even proactively trigger failures using something like chaos engineering. Testing in prod, if you do it well, isn't some haphazard YOLO mode of operation. It's a disciplined framework for responding to errors, which are inevitable, instead of pretending you can prevent them all. But it doesn't dictate that we should stop testing before prod. It's about risk. We need to think about what could go wrong and what are the consequences when that does. So say you're running a site of memes. You've got a lot of pressure to keep up with evolving culture and a low cost of errors. Because if something goes wrong, what's your user going to do? Well, they'll just click try it again. Or maybe they'll get a messed up meme and decide that's actually really cool and that becomes a new meme. Great. What if you're running an e-commerce site? You might have a case where you charge someone money and they don't get the product. Uh, that's not so great. Now you've got angry customers. You may have um, some remediation to do with customer service, maybe even a lawsuit some, if there's enough of it. What if you're running a hospital power grid? Eww. Now we have a really high cost of errors. So we need to make informed choices about our risk tolerance and then continuously optimize how we do integration testing. What are we optimizing for? The big six. Fidelity, isolation, speed, scalability, ephemerality, and cost. Let's take a look at these. Fidelity, how similar is the test environment to production? The closer it is, the more diagnostic it is, but also the more expensive and complicated it's likely to be. It's also likely that you may not be actually be able to match it exactly. You can't run a 200 node Kubernetes cluster on your laptop. One of my colleagues at Google asked a, a great question about this just yesterday. So here's Yana saying, is it possible today to run uh, your early infrastructure that exactly matches your production infrastructure? And I really like this response. So yes, it is possible. But honestly, it's not really likely in the real world. Next, isolation. We don't want tests that interfere with each other or that interfere with prod systems. We want everything to have a known environment that it holds throughout this, uh, the duration of the test. Have you ever had this experience where you're running a, a, a test and all of a sudden everything just goes haywire? And you shout across the room, hey, what's up with staging? And someone's like, oh, I dropped the database because I wanted to see how long it would take to restore. And you're like, grrr, and then you fight. Uh, that's not great. And it's also generally best not to test against external resources or test against prod resources when you're running a local test. Has anyone ever done that? It's not ideal because even if you're only doing a read against an API, it's possible to DDoS your own servers. It's also possible to send malformed requests that totally break things. So we'd rather have every test has its own environment that no one else can touch. Speed. According to Dora, reducing the time from commit to deploy is correlated with positive business outcomes. So we need fast CICD to get fast deployments. Fast is better than slow. And beyond speed, we need more speed. No matter how fast our individual builds are, pretty soon we're going to have a situation where we want to run more than one at a time. If there's any more builds than workers, this is going to result in queuing. And that makes developers less productive and it makes them sad. Because, I, I, frankly, I don't know about you, but when I have a build that is running and it's running slow, I'm like, meh, nah, I'm not loving this. If my build is down in the bottom of the queue and it's not even running, oh, that's no fun. So we want happy developers and we want happy stakeholders. So we want to be able to run a lot of builds at the same time. How many? Well, you can see the word cloud on my chest, so I'm going to say all of them. Ephemerality. How long does your test infrastructure last? Ideally, test infrastructure lasts exactly as long as you want it. 
If it's not being used, we don't want to pay for it. So this would mean that your test infrastructure should disappear as soon as the test is over. Or maybe not. Generally, if everything works OK, if you have a passing test, then it, go ahead and deprovision the, the infrastructure. You don't need it anymore. But if you have a failing test, you might want to go on there and tinker with it, figure out what's going on. However, you don't want that to hang around forever. You want to go poke at it while it's still fresh in context. So we need to find a compromise between how long our infra should hang out. Cost, because of course, nobody wants to spend more money on their testing infrastructure than they spend on their production infrastructure. And I think there's two factors at play here. One is a rational factor, which is how much money are you spending? And then the other is a little bit more of an emotive factor, which is, am I getting my money's worth? And so preferably, cost is correlated with usage, so that even if you're spending a lot, at least you're knowing you're getting some insights out of it. All right, so we're going to show an example of doing some integration testing. And here's our example application. As you can see, it's a multi-service microservice application because it has two services. But we're engineers here, right? We know that there are only three numbers in the world. 0, 1, and oh, this one's got infinity, infinity microservices. Uh, the truth is that what we're doing here can definitely scale up to lots of service. Each of these services is independently packaged and can run separately, but by themselves, they don't really do a lot for you. The web service by itself doesn't have any stuff on it, and the database service by itself doesn't have much of a user experience. It, engineers might love it, running SQL queries to find out what cookies are available in the shop, but probably not going to be successful. So for this purpose, we're going to say that a unit test corresponds to testing one of those microservices, which is, may or may not be exactly how you think of unit tests, but let's go with it. And an integration test is when we test multiple of those together to see that the application is working. Here's our CI-CD infrastructure. We're running Jenkins on Kubernetes, which gets you a lot of cool benefits. Um, and I will talk about those some more tomorrow morning. But uh, it's not actually necessary for what we're showing here. And then it talks to a cloud and uses some various cloud services and doodads. And then it's got two Kubernetes clusters that it's deploying to. It'll deploy to staging, and then it'll deploy to a production server. The flow for testing these is the same across all of them, where first we build our containers, and then we're going to provision a test infrastructure to test them in. And we provision, uh, sorry, deploy those containers into that test infrastructure. So now we have a running application. Then we run a test. And this is a really simple version of a test. It's actually just a shell script that uh, grabs the URL and grabs it for some content. And then when it's done, we're going to deprovision that test infrastructure so we don't have to keep paying for it. I want to show you four different ways that we can perform a test like this. They all achieve the same thing. They use different methods to provision that test infrastructure. For the first technique, we're going to use Docker Compose. Now, Docker Compose is a way to stitch together multiple containerized services. In some ways, it's like a, a Kubernetes light. And it's really great for developers because it's a really easy config to write, and it can run on your machine with just Docker, no need for a full-on Kubernetes environment. So we can run integration tests with it. And there are a few different ways to run the Docker Compose in your CI system. So for this example, we're going to use a self-destructing VM. Wait, a what? A self-destructing VM, because as part of this test, we're going to spin up a VM to run Docker Compose in. Now, that creates that risk of orphan, orphaned resources. If the test fails, we're still paying for that VM to hang around. So we're going to program a compute instance that will delete itself after a set period of time. And so to do that, we launch it with a script that has a timer in it. And after that set amount of time, I've got ours set for a default of four hours, it makes an API call makes an API call out to the cloud and says, hey, Google Cloud, delete an instance with the name, my name, and then poof, it disappears. If you want to try making your own self-destructing VMs, you can grab that bit.ly link there. So we started our commit, and we're going to build our containers, run those unit tests on the containers, and then provision them into this VM. Then Docker Compose spins up those containers, um, and has them talking to each other to create the application. Then we run our test script, and when it works, we tear it down. If it doesn't work, it hangs around, but after a little while, it self-destructs. The good part about uh, using this system is that it's developer-friendly. 
The bad part is that Docker Compose is not Kubernetes, right? It actually works in slightly different ways, and it therefore is not completely predictive or has not, doesn't have complete fidelity to your production environment. It also means having to maintain multiple configs, which can drift. Um, there are different ways that you can run Docker Compose in a Kubernetes environment. Uh, I've tried a couple of them and had mixed success. Other ways uh, might be more successful. But it works. And, and again, whenever I talk to people about Docker, developers know Docker Compose. They're really familiar with it. So a lot of people might prefer this. Technique two is where we're going to maintain a standing staging cluster, one staging cluster. In this case, after we build, what we're going to do is going to create a namespace in that staging cluster. Then we're going to deploy our application into the namespace, and we're going to retrieve back an endpoint for that application. Uh, anyone familiar with Kubernetes might say, oh, you're going to go get a load balancer. But I'm actually doing a node port instead, because node, load balancers take time to provision, and I just need one node, so I just go ahead and grab one node um, and pull the, uh, pull the um, node port for it. Then we run our test specifically against that namespace, and then at the end, provision, destroy. So the good news about this is it's fast. That Kubernetes cluster is already existing, and creating a namespace is really fast. Deploying small containers to it is really fast. It's also really high fidelity, because we're running against a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, I'm running mine in Kubernetes engine, which is the same engine that I'm running prod in. Downside is the isolation is not perfect. By default, namespaces can't talk to each other within a cluster. But they are running in the same virtual boxes. So if they're using up a lot of resources, they could stomp on each other. Also, you can't test cluster-wide things. So like a CRD, a Kubernetes Custom Resource Definition, is a cluster-wide resource. So you can't use this technique to test that. Um, and finally, on a failure, you might have an orphan namespace, just never got cleaned up. It's not perfect, but it's also really not that expensive, an orphan namespace that no one's uh, running anything in. It's not a big deal. And you could always run a, a script that runs every week or something and cleans up the ones that people forgot about. All right. But what we could do if we want better isolation is run Kubernetes per test. And what we're going to do here is run a single node Kubernetes. And you see Kubernetes in quotes because there's a few different ways of doing this. Um, and these are binaries that create a Kubernetes compatible API layer inside a single VM with a lightweight startup. There's a number of these. Uh, one of them is called um, Minikube, another one is Microcates, and another one is K3S. K3S is five less than K8S. And that's the one we're using here. So it spins up really fast. It's actually, like the others, it's CNCF confirmed or uh, uh, certified compliant Kubernetes in, uh, interface. So in theory, it's the same thing as Kubernetes, just lighter. And you get perfect isolation in this situation. The downside is it's still not exactly Kubernetes. Maybe there's issues there. And you could have orphaned resources with this one again. We do the, the self-destructing um, self VM, but still, every, time, every minute that your VMs are ticking and not being used, you're paying money. All right, now finally, when I was working through this, people asked me, well, why not just give you, uh, use a Google Kubernetes engine cluster for every test? I was like, that's crazy. You're going to provision this crazy infrastructure? But of course, it's the cloud. Of course we can. Um, so I tried it. And it actually worked relatively well. Um, it takes a little more time to start up the cluster. And it's going to cost a little bit more. But if you really need perfect isolation and perfect fidelity, you can use this method. All right. Let's see this in action. Now, this is not a live demo. Why? Because I'm scared of live demos. I had a situation not long ago. I was in uh, Eastern Europe, and I was ready to do a demo. And this was a great conference. The people were really excited. They were passionate. The energy was electric. The electricity was not so electric. Uh, and just when I was about to give my demo, the uh, internet went out, and I was refreshing nothing. And then I spent 20 minutes apologizing to the audience. So we're going to show you how this looks without relying on wires that have to leave this room. All right. So here's our flow. And you can see we start by creating our containers. Then we create a configuration for the application. And then we run in parallel four different versions of how we're going to do this test. If you're doing your own integration testing, you want to pick one. But the point here is to show how four of them uh, compete. 
So the first thing that happens is we're going to use Kaneko to build our images. Now, if you've ever tried to build Docker images on Kubernetes, you've likely run into problems with Docker in Docker. Everything in Kubernetes runs inside a container. Building a container from inside a container is sort of possible, maybe really hard and breaks security and just don't do it. So instead we're using Kaneko, which is a product, uh, a, an open source project that was originated at Google. And it's a way of building Docker containers without using a Docker daemon and without needing a Docker socket. So that runs in Kubernetes on the containers um, and builds from a standard Docker file. And then once it finishes building, can push to a registry. The DB spins up faster here because it's just a, uh, basically a stock MySQL database that we inject test data to. And then web takes a little longer. It's got some unit tests and things. Then the next step is we need to take those newly built artifacts, which are dedicated to this test. They're tagged with the test run ID. And we're going to create a Kubernetes manifest out of them. So we're going to use Customize. Customize is an application that lets you combine multiple Kubernetes templates into one and also override um, elements within those so that we can say which of the containers we're going to use. So now we've got a hydrated Kubernetes manifest that defines our application with exactly the artifacts made for this test. And now we're going to deploy this to our various means of doing Kubernetes. The first one that's going to finish is that shared staging cluster. It's already up and running. It's firing. It's ready to go. It's really fast to just connect to it, push the manifest, and it runs. The next one that's going to come up is Docker Compose. So then we have to spin up a VM pretty fast. Um, and then Docker Compose is pre-installed on that VM image, and that runs quickly. Next, a little slower, not much, is the K3S in a VM image, uh, in which case uh, K3S is pre-installed. takes a little bit longer. There's a little more machinery in there than there is for Docker Compose. But that one's pretty quick, too. And then finally, that cluster per test comes up and executes. And then we can deploy it to like a user acceptance testing or other environment to make sure that uh, it's ready to go with prod or we could push straight to prod if we're the kind of team that does continuous deployment. Um, and in this case, one great way to do that is using a GKE plugin. So I mentioned that Google creates great plugins for our users. And one of them is a GKE plugin that automates deployments into your GKE cluster. It's a really easy command, and you don't have to think as much about um, your auth and uh, all your configuration. It's, it's all secured by the Google Cloud IAM, but it's really easy to use. So let's look at a comparison of the various ways that uh, we can do this. They all have pros and cons. They all have trade-offs. Some of them are more isolated. Some of them are higher fidelity. Some of them are faster. And each one of them has a purpose. And it's even possible that if you want to implement stuff like this, that you'd use multiple. So like early on in your testing, you might want to do something fast and cheap that has maybe a little bit lower fidelity. And then as you progress to the right, you turn up the fidelity and run those expensive GKE per test runs only when you really need that final, uh, final look-see. So there's no single right answer. And yet, when uh, people ask me which one of these is best, I kind of keep coming back to the same one, which is this one. Now, normally, I would be loath to suggest that everyone in your organization test on one staging environment. That's going to get you those problems I was talking about before. I broke the staging environment. Now you can't use it. You got a lock on it, and now it's queued to your user ID, and you went on vacation. This is terrible. Except this works. And the reason it works is those beautiful, beautiful namespaces. It's really very good isolation. You're running on true Kubernetes infrastructure. And you're paying only for one instance that can auto scale up and down. So you even scale down to a minimum amount of, um, minimum amount of compute that you're using. So unless you have some really high need for that perfect fidelity, or if you're testing things that, where this won't work for the isolation purposes, use this method. Don't forget the namespaces. That's essential. But Dave, what about if I have lots of services? It might be really hard to spin up dozens of services all for one test. Yes, it might. So there are other ways to, to bring in services to an integration test. Um, you certainly can rely on Semver and have parts of it that's outside of your testing boundaries. Then you're counting on a little bit of hope, but that might be appropriate. You can also look at uh, 
rocks and stubs and things like that to, to, to stub it out. Um, and, uh, and also you can make a choice of just simply not running certain kinds of tests. Dave, what about databases? Yeah, this is the hard one, right? In this example, we used a MySQL database with some testing data. It's really fast, because you know what? There's three lines of data in the whole thing. In real world, preferably, we would run against a database data set that is identical to the real world. But that gives us two problems. One is speed. A real world data set, we usually measure in like terabytes. And in testing, we want to measure it in like kilobytes. So in order to understand what your system is going to perform like, you need a full size database. And the other problem, of course, is PII. Your database has data that you shouldn't be messing with. So ideally, we would have a process where we can extract data from the live database, sanitize or anonymize it, and then inject that into our testing. And, and some people do that. Other people are going to maintain their own test data set and make sure that as the production database evolves that they um, are pruning and maintaining the, the schemas. There's no easy answer here in my opinion. Here's a great resource for learning how to use Jenkins, and of course, especially for learning how to use it with Google Cloud. I particularly want to mention one of the plugins that we publish, which is the Google Compute Engine plugin. It automatically provisions GKE instances on the fly. So if uh, the worker, so when you start a build, that worker node is created right at the time of the build, and it'll automatically be deprovisioned at the end, if you want it to be. So remember what we talked about with ephemerality. Maybe we want it to hang around. So you can configure it to let those instances stay on a failed build so that you can then connect to them and debug against them. Or, and this is my favorite part, you can configure it so that the build infra, the workers, will always be deprovisioned at the end of the build. But if it's a failure, they'll take a snapshot of it and store that for you in Google Cloud Storage as, a, as an image. And that means you're not paying for it unless you need it. But if you do need it, you need to get into the uh, VM of a failed build you can simply spin that up and use it any time. And cloud storage is really pretty cheap, whereas running VMs is not always so cheap. So I think that's the best, best of both worlds. In summary, we can still do integration testing. It might be hard. It may or may not be worth it. And we have to do some hard questions about risk versus reward. When you find your own sweet spot, I'd love to hear about it. So come talk at me, tweet at me, and let me know what you've learned. Thank you. I don't know if we're doing questions or if anyone has questions. All right, everyone go home. Thank you. <laughs>